the Polyglot Gathering is brought to you by italki. Become fluent in any language. All right, so welcome everyone. Um, welcome to this lecture. I wanted to ask you, how many of you speak Chinese actually? Raise your hand. All right, and how many of you read Chinese? A fluent, really, fluently read Chinese? <laughs> and how many of you know something about the etymology of Chinese characters and how they work? Oh, all right. <laughs> well, so welcome to this lecture. My name is Vladimir Skoteti. I work as an interpreter of uh, Mandarin, Chinese, and English, but I also do have a bachelor's degree in Chinese studies. And uh, for nine years, uh, I've been studying and learning Chinese, and for about five of that, I've been researching etymology of Chinese characters. So in this lecture, I hopefully will show you some of the results of that research, but hopefully in a very minimalist and easy to understand way. So. Whether you are a complete beginner or someone who doesn't know Chinese at all, or you are an intermediate student or advanced student, I'm pretty sure the question you all have asked yourselves was that, like, why do Chinese people write like this? Well, <laughs> you know, why is it so complicated? Why, why do we see no patterns? Why, um, why are there so many different characters? The, the only pattern that you can see right now is probably the full stop, which is actually a circle, and it cannot be a dot because it would, it would, it might blend in with the character before, and it might be confusing. So, yeah, a lot of these questions that I have been asking myself um, as well, and and why do we write like this, right? Clearly, I mean, I can't read this because this is a dummy text, but I can tell you that this is just a word because there is space between another word, and you just know that that's a word, and probably I could read this out loud. And even if I don't know what it understands, but a person who, who, know, who knows that, who would speak that language, would understand me. Whereas here, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. So, to understand this, uh, we need to go a little bit back, and we need to understand how Chinese characters came to be, and build on one misconception, which is that Chinese characters are pictures. And that is a very common misconception. Chinese characters, for the most part, I would say 95% today, are not pictures. But they are based on pictures. Um, so, what we need to do is go back maybe five, six thousand years. We don't know exactly when Chinese characters were first invented and when the first person in China had the idea to write something down. But when he had that idea, instead of doing what we did to choose symbols that represent individual sounds, he chose pictures. So, in a very, very little experiment, I'm going to show you that we can use pictures to write down the English language. So, for instance, if, and actually very functionally, even today, so if I say apple, and I do this, I guess we can all agree that this is an apple, and it, it transmits the information very well. I mean, someone might ask, okay, is it, is it a fruit in general, or, or is it maybe, is it, is it a clip art of an apple? But we can agree that it's, it's going to transmit the image of an apple very well. Small objects, bigger objects, this is a bear, no problem with that. This is an eye, smaller objects. Um, even more complex, like faces. It's, it's really not a problem to, to transmit concrete objects that we can feel, see, right? Um, intangible objects, objects are a little bit more difficult, but when, once still there, like, uh, as soon as they're tangible, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty okay. We can go a little bit further with images. Actions, this might be running, jumping, swimming. It doesn't look like swimming, but I like the image, so <laughs> I chose it. Um, and emotions, right? So, for instance, this could be happy, this could be angry, this could be hungry, and so on. And uh, we just went through three very important building blocks of written language. Nouns, verbs, and adjectives, right? And from this we can start building verbs, and this is all very simplified and, and of course has nothing to do with characters yet, but I'm just going to trying to show you how, what they were doing when they were creating the writing system. From here we can, and this could be big, um, and once you have that, we had nouns, we had verbs, we had adjectives, we can start building very simple sentences, right, so, or collocations, so if we have hungry and bear, we have a hungry bear. <laughs> and if we, if we reverse the two characters, bear hungry, there is almost an is that pops up, and you have a bear is hungry. You have a very simple sentence, and you can start adding stuff to it, big bear is hungry, right, Big Bear is hungry and angry, <laughs> and stuff like that. So the guy who was writing, or it's really difficult to tell like how actually this came to be, that people started to write and why they had to write something down. Writing is one of the most amazing uh, inventions in, in human history, because um, 
Yeah, this is a different story for a different time, but it's just, that's what it is. Um, they, using this system, having images for concrete objects and for, for you know, verbs of motion and, and things that you can actually see, um, inevitably they come into a, to, to a place where, where they're blocked, you know, they're limited. Because you can say bear is hungry, but, and this is still bear hungry, not even bear is hungry. Um, it's really like a Neanderthal talk, like a caveman talk, and the language back then was very developed already, I think. So, for instance, if you say, bear is hungry, this is how you would write it, but what if you want to say, I am hungry, right? I is a very abstract <laughs> term, basically, it's almost impossible, or it, it could be, you could probably have a person pointing at, at himself, meaning I, but there's a more elegant way of doing that, and uh, <coughs> they did this, I hungry, right? They <laughs> chose a character that sounded like the picture that they had, they, that sounded exactly the same way as that abstract word, and it was, this would be, I am hungry, and we can just go further. I not hang, <laughs> hungry. I am not hungry. All right. So these two, the first two pictures, they don't represent anymore what they actually stood for. It's just their sound that is there. They agreed on the fact that now, from now on, I and not, in our case here for English, is going to represent just this, the, the other word that sounds the same. That is very abstract. I see. C is kind of difficult maybe to write down, so I chose that. I don't see. I don't see bear, right? And you can go on. I don't see the hungry bear <laughs> and stuff like that. I don't see the angry and hungry bear. So um, we're moving on in the, in the creation of the writing system very swiftly, but still we're very limited because this is still not I don't see an angry and a hungry bear, this is just I not see angry, hungry bear. So we're still, we still are missing a lot of the blocks that that we need to put into the language to, in order to make it a fully functional written system that would represent the spoken language. And another thing that, that is a, probably maybe a bigger problem here when you are creating the writing system is that if you really need, need um, sort of like a picture for everything that you need to represent, well, you need a whole lot of pictures because you would need to create a picture for every single thing that you see. And, and that's exactly what happened. So there was thousands and thousands and thousands of images that were being created and the people back then it's difficult to tell how good their memories were, but it, even back then it would be it would have been really really difficult to remember all these pictures. So somehow they had to start to be more effective. One of the ways they did that was to recycle sort of the pictures they had and just use specifying. In, in this case, I used an arrow. They they used something else, but just just to show how it worked. So this would not be an eye. This would be an eyelid, right? This would be the eye canal. This would be the retina or the iris. Um, and this was very good because suddenly you have still only one character, but with pictures pointing to a different part in it. Um, and therefore, that you know, the, the, the number of characters wasn't exponentially different characters wasn't exponentially or even like I think it's a geometrical expansion. It wasn't expanded that fast. Another thing that they did, they were combining existing characters. So, for instance, you have an I in a book that would be read, right? And, uh, like uh, given the fact that you already have an image for a book, you would just combine it. This would be, uh, that's a keyhole, so that would be like to spy or to peek. And again, these are just random examples. This is not really how Chinese characters, it, these are not exact actual Chinese characters. This is just the system, how they work. And um, this would be uh, to sleep, like uh, you're sleepy, so you close your eyes and you go to bed or something like that. Now, another problem that they came to was because this is always always still still a very limited uh, very limited system was that if given what we've what we've said before that you have a, a, this character or this image here which would be a knot and since I told you that it could be a knot as in the actual knot but it can also mean not as in I'm not going to do it how do we know which one it is so of course it was confusing to them too. Um, so they decided again just to give it a little specifier. So if I if I do this and then give it a little X, which is our symbol for no, then we would know that in this case this combination would mean no, right? And this was a major major breakthrough. So if you have an I, how do you know if it's an I as in the actual I or it's I as in? E? <coughs> and again you just add a little face and now you know that it's the I in the face and it's it's the actual I. And this was a major, major break breakthrough because evo evolutionarily, from an evo evolutionary point of view, this proved to be the best invention in Chinese characters because these, this type of characters is now about 90 to 95% percent 
of all most frequent characters in Chinese. So when I said in the beginning that it's a misconception that Chinese characters are pictures, they are based on pictures. But 95% of characters in use today are of this kind. So that is, you have the sound of it specified by what it means. And this is how they, this type of characters originated, but when you look at it from a different angle, it, it's actually a character that, is, that consists of two parts. One tells you how to pronounce it, and the other one tells you what it means, right? You pronounce it as I, and it means the actual, the actual I. So what they did, they had about, not sure about the exact numbers, but probably about, um, well, let's say two, three hundred of these that would specify the meaning, and about six, seven hundred frequent these that would tell you the pronunciation. And they would just start combining them and recycling them, which was very effective. Um, because in the end, you have only the same characters combining, right? Looking at it from a, from a different angle. So, without knowing, I just showed you all the types of Chinese characters in existence today, except for one. The first one is an I, which is the actual I, right? It's a picture of what it stands for. There are only about, I think, 200 of these left in Chinese and used today. And only about, if I'm not, like if I'm, I hope I'm correct, there's only 100 and something of them which are quite frequent. Um, so, as I said, it's a misconception that Chinese characters are pictures because there's only about 100 of these left that are very, very frequent. But the thing is that they're so frequent that you see them very, very often. So, if you have a text, if you have a Chinese text, you will see a lot of these that are actual pictures, or used to be actual pictures, not only that, like that anymore. But that's still very, very little compared to the 95% of the, of the other type that I was talking about. The next type of characters are these here, which, is, which are basically the, a character specified by an, a pointer or an arrow or, or a circle or something like that, which would be pointing to, a, to, to, to what it actually means. So in this case, it was the icon out. The third type, quite frequent but still not too much, are the ones where you just combine two meanings. So this was an I and a book, which means to read. The fourth one was, these are called the so-called phonetic clones, uh, and all of these have fancy names, I don't want to, I don't want to like, tell them to you because it's, I don't think it's, it's very useful. Um, where it's a knot, but it's not representing the meaning of an actual knot, it's just the knot as in I'm not going to do that. What is that? I'm not doing it. <laughs> and the last one is, where you have um, the sound specified by something. That, that's how it started. Now it's just really a combination of the sound and the meaning. Um, and, and the character which, which really, these are 95%, 90 to 95% of, of all characters. So this, this is probably the most important piece of information from this talk. Because Chinese characters really work like this, most of them. There are these frequency uh, numbers and all that, so even though these characters represent 90 plus percent of all characters in use, but still you have the other ones which are very, very frequent, so you can see them everywhere. It seems like, yes, Chinese characters are pictures, but they're actually not. They are really almost like an alphabet, because this is giving you the sound, and this is giving you the meaning, right? So, one last problem that we have here is that Chinese characters don't look like this. Right? There are n a number of problems with writing, if we were to write this, like use this, use this to, um, to write English down or Slovak down or Hungarian down, a, a bunch of problems. <laughs> the first one would probably be that if you want to write hungry, this would take you maybe like 10 minutes to, <laughs> to write this picture, a bear or a knot or, or a C. Um, that's the first problem. Um, so it's too complex, too complicated if you, if you really use pictures. So you can't use pictures to, to write because it's, it's just going to take too much time. And the second thing is that if I would ask you here to, to, to basically write this, what you see, I think I would have about 70 different results. And if I wouldn't know this sentence and you would give it to me, I could not read it because everyone has a different style. So it's not uniform. So it's too complicated and too uniform. So what they did, they had to simplify. And so, we have still I not see the hungry bear. I'm just gonna give like show these pictures and then we go again. I not see the hungry bear, and this is already better. This resembles Chinese characters very much. Um, actually, one, two of these are characters that are written in the so-called seal script. So these are actual characters. The first, second, and the last one I invented <coughs> just to show you how it works. 
Um, but Chinese characters, they still, still don't look like this. And the reason for that is still the same problem. They are still too complicated to write and still not uniform enough. Like for instance, the circles and the ovals. A lot of people could have a different idea about how to write those. And the structural blocks to these, like for instance, this stroke over here, and this stroke over here, and this stroke over here, and then you have this one. Um, if you want to teach a nation to write and read, you really need to have something as simple as our alphabet. So you have just a couple of strokes that are, I don't know how many stroke types are there in our alphabets, but there must be maybe like, maybe 10. So you need to have uniform strokes that you can uh, use to build up these characters. And you get to this, basically. So this is still, I, not, see, the hungry, bear. Very, very simplified. Used with very uniform strokes. So let me, let me try to count the strokes. So this is a one stroke type. This is a second stroke type. This, this is still just one. This is the third one, third stroke type, fourth stroke type, fifth, just a little dot. And then there are variations like hooks and all that, but still we're talking about only eight, if I'm not mistaken, eight basic stroke types of which all characters are below. If you wonder, this character doesn't exist, I invented it, this one doesn't exist, this is a very, very rare character. These, only these two characters are actually real Chinese characters. So I use this just to, just to basically show you the evolution. Of, uh, of the writing. And so now let's get to actual actual Chinese characters. So now I'm going to talk about Chinese characters that are of the type where um, an eye is the actual eye, right? Pictures, the rare ones, the, the 100 characters that are left. This is the Chinese character of a person. Started out, and this is already very simplified, as a sort of like a person's um, facing right. Of all the little bit more complicated and then simplified in the most modern version, which is still about 2,000 years old. <laughs> so the modern character, I call it modern because it is really modern compared to this one, but we're still talking, uh, you know, we're very far, very far in history. We're far back in history, this is a person. This is a woman, um, woman kneeling, probably nursing a child, maybe, maybe a child or holding something. More complicated than the intermediary step and then simplified into the, you know, so that it could use only the strokes that are in use in the, in the modern versions of the characters. So it does resemble, but it is already very, very far from a picture, right? So again, still, misconception, Chinese characters are not actual pictures anymore, even if they are based on pictures. A horse, the original one looks like a horse, and this is a seal script version for those who, are, who know who seal, what seal script is. So there were previous versions, but the modern one is based on that. And then we have a mo the, the modern traditional and simplified, for those of you who know, you know what that is. Uh, what's the difference between traditional and simplified? Uh, for those of you who don't, it's just, um, in this case, a simplification. The four dots were replaced by one stroke, and this thing here just arbitrarily sim simplified, but just, just a bended stroke. Well, I mean, this is the standardization of the strokes so was a natural process? Well, uh, I'm not sure, actually, because I haven't seen a book which would be like a the Chinese scribe's guide to creating Chinese characters from 2000 BC, like, you know, I don't know. I think maybe there was, there must have been, because China was so developed and so advanced in, in I don't know, uh, like 100 B, uh, BC, that they actually probably had a department that was dealing with this, with standardization. Can they go back to Qin Shi Huang, uh, the, the first Chinese emperor, because that, he actually- That was this, the, that was the this. kingdoms used the standard, one yeah. standard, uh, well, more or less what it's and that's the, that's exactly this one. So this is already a standardized, unified form in 200 and something BCE. But still, it evolved. Yes, please. On Taiwan, I think they still use the non-simplified form. Yes. Right. Which uh, tells us that one simplification must have taken place. After the Actually, uh, some of the simplified characters are very, very old. They just chose them to replace the complicated ones for practical reasons. And even in Taiwan, they read, and in books they have traditional, but when they write, sometimes they simplify in written, because it's faster. It's obviously much faster. Um, and then some interesting characters like this one. Today, this character means to return, one of the meanings that it has. But its original meaning was to revolve. And you can see the spiral here. And in the intermediary step, this is just a question of formatting. Um, two kind of circles looked much better in that script, so they chose two, two con concentric circles or squares instead of a spiral. And in the modern one, it turned into two squares. 
And I wanted to demonstrate on this character a very important point. When you learn Chinese characters and you have books about Chinese characters, often you will find these, I call them like Zen storytelling. So they will tell you why these two squares actually mean to return. And they will say, oh, because it's a concept of a, of a, of a big square going down to a small one and returning to a big one. Well, no, actually it's not. It used to mean <laughs> revolve. <laughs> it was a spiral. Then it was this, and then it was this. But you need to know the history, right? And there's, I was, um, there was this one very, very good um, Chinese researcher way back, his name was Viger, and uh, if you read his books, they are full of these explanations where you have, oh, it's the heavenly principle and the, I don't know, and then when you go back one step, you see that, no, it actually was maybe, it meant hand, and it's really a picture of a hand, but it changed so much that you can't tell anymore. So, um, what I try to do with my research, and this, actually, uh, I'm writing a book about Chinese characters, this, this is all in it. Uh, I try to go to the to the most realistic explanation to every single character because there usually is one. Like ninety nine percent of the characters are are really very logical. Like you just need to know the original meaning. It's, if you realize that this character might be two thousand five hundred, three thousand years old, and it changed in so many ways in shape, in pronunciation, in meaning. So of course, if you just look at these two squares and you and you, and you tell someone this is to to return, and if I were to ask you, okay, give me your best shot with your imagination and explain to me why these two squares mean to return, I'm sure you would give me some fantastic stories. <laughs> but <laughs> the fact of the matter is, it meant to revolve <laughs> and only happened to be formatted by someone in the, in the imperial court like this because it looked good in that particular way of writing. This character, for instance, means to go one of the uh, meanings that it has. Originally, it used to mean a crossroad, a ro and you can see that, right? A road with two connecting roads. And then it kind of branched and, and got more fancy in the seal script. This is the Xin Shu Huang, right? And the, that was adopted um, about 200 BC. And just formatting, and there's more, more actually, to more explanation to this character. I don't want to go into depth, but it's based on the shape of the crossroad still. But as you can see, to fit the formatting of the most modern version, 2,000 years old version, um, it looks like this. And so again, this, this left part has a meaning, this has a sound and all that. I don't want to go into details, but it is based on the shape of that. So now we go to the characters where the not doesn't mean a not, but it means not. It's a so-called phonetic loan. So this is the Chinese character for no. Originally, it used to mean a Sorry, plants roots. This is the sort of like the plant of this. This is the root system. This is the intermediary step from Qin Shu Huang, uh, from the seal script. And this is just really a simplification of this. Again, millions of stories that I heard. Uh, supposedly, someone said that this is a, a, a simplified picture of a bird flying up to the sky, and this is a figurative no stopping him. <laughs> but, you know, like he can't fly any, any, but it's not like that. It used to mean a root system. It just sounded exactly the same way as the word no in ancient Chinese. So they said, all right, well, no is a really difficult concept to write as a, as a picture. So let's just use this root system to, to represent that. This is the Chinese character for and, yet, something like that. Again, a very, very abstract word. It used to be a beard, a beard of a person. You can clearly see the beard. A little bit formatted in a different way. Today it looks like this. Again, millions of stories <laughs> as to why it means and, right? So uh, this part and this part is divided by this, and you know, many, many Zen stories that <laughs> can you can find. So um, if you learn about Chinese characters, I really tell you, 95% or maybe even more of what I read, there is a very, very good logic behind why there are the way they are. There are no abstract. Um, there's no abstract reasoning behind most of the characters. This character means to be able to do something. Originally, it was a bear. It really was a bear. Like, this character used to mean bear. Uh, sorry if you can't see it uh, from the back. Um, then it got a little bit fancier. Um, this is the next step. You can still see, like, the, the, the fancy feet and the, and the head. And this is the modern one. And the, the thing is that in the modern character, this part, this part, this part, and this part all have a meaning. Actually, have you can like separate them and, and have four, like in this case, three uh, characters. And again, it's very easy to invent a story as to why these four characters mean to be able to do something. But no, it's not. It was just the bear. <laughs> but 
today is written like this after all the simplifications and all the changes and all the formatting that has been done. Now we have the characters that combine the meaning of two. So to read, you have an I in a book. This is the Chinese character for to look at something, to read. Um, the top part of the character, this one, is a hand, or the character for hand in a sort of formatted way. The bottom part is an eye, so basically you put your hand over your eyes when you look into the distance. Very figurative, but still, this is, this is the character to read. This is uh, uh, the character for opinion or meaning or something like that. Two parts, the top part is the sound, is, it, it, is, it means sound, the bottom part is heart or soul. So the sound of your soul, the sound of your heart, your opinions, your meanings. This is very close to Zen storytelling, but still this is actually pretty clear uh, to, to, as opposed to other uh, explanations that I have read. This is the Chinese character for good. The original meaning of this character, however, was to be fond of, which is still a modern meaning of this character, but pronounced in a different tone. Composed of woman and child. Woman and her child. Right. So, so these, these are the characters when, when people often say, oh, Chinese characters are so interesting because you can see these stories in them. Yeah, but only in like 2% of them, <laughs> because the, the rest I will show you in a bit. Another type of Chinese characters that I was talking about with these little specifiers. So this is a Chinese character, which means roots. The big um, black part is a tree, and the little green thing, which I don't know if you can see very well, is that um, specifier, which specifies the bottom part of the tree the roots. Very few characters like this. I would say maybe really just a handful of infrequent use. I would say maybe 20 to 30. I'm just saying this off the top of my head so I don't have the exact statistics. Uh, but they're very frequent. Like Japan is Japan, the roots of like where the sun comes up, the basis of the sun. Right? Could you also pronounce the characters? What is that? Could you also please pronounce? Sure, sure, no problem. So this is Mian. <laughs> it means face and also different meanings. Originally written like this, the inside of the character is um, head, and the outside circle points, or sort of just figuratively points to the face. This is the older version, or the original version. In the modern version, the, the circle shifted a little bit down, so that the top part, this here, and a different formatting stayed out of the circle, but still, this is the circle, and this is, this is sort of the other part of the character. And now we get to the, to the most frequently used characters, the ones where the not is specified by something telling you that it's actually the not as in I'm not going to do it. Most frequent characters, like I said, 90 to 95% of Chinese characters work like this. <coughs> this is the Chinese character which is uh, ba. It means to, many, many meanings, but it means to take something. The blue part, it would be this one, is pronounced ba. Um, it has a meaning, but it's, it, I think it's uh, like a cobra or something originally, but it doesn't have to do anything with the meaning of the character. But the green part is a hand, so this tells you what it means, and this tells you what you should, like, what's the, what is pronunciation, it, pronunciation is. So, ba, to take, this is ba, and a hand. Tao, to arrive at a place. This part, the blue one, pronounced tao. The left part is pronounced zhi, means to arrive. So this character as a whole means to arrive, pronounced tao, and meaning zhi, to arrive, right? Hai, child. Left part of the character, this one, the green one, um, zi, child or son, so you know how, what it means. The right part of the character is pronounced hai. It has a meaning, but it's not necessary in this case. It's just the pronunciation that is important in this character. These are all very regular. Unfortunately, only about, as I guess I would say 20%, 15 to 20% of Chinese characters are this regular. That means, because they're really, really very old, so a lot of changes have taken place. Pronunciation, structural changes, sometimes they fuse, I will show you characters in a bit, where the, the left and the right part just fuse together, and you're not able to tell anymore today in the modern character that there is actually a structure in there like that. No, that's another problem. No, like I just you saw right here, where was it? No, in, these, in this case, still. Um, it's, I think it started out like that. And I actually have, I had a thought, and this is a little bit too technical, that they might be, uh, there might be a system as to when it is on the right side and when it is on the left side. But I haven't been able to verify. Right? So this character, I'm not really sure if you can see this. This is a character, Nian, and it means... 
So this is a character which means year, and its original meaning was grain, a type of a grain, maybe oats or something like that. Originally, however, it, I don't really know if you can see it. It was written like this. It was two characters. The top one, and the, I chose the green color always to represent the meaning, is, is just grain. It, it really is a character that means grain. And the bottom one is pronounced qian. So nian, qian, that was the sound. And the top one is giving me the meaning. But it evolved and fused into this. It's just fused because they simplified it and, and it's fused. So look, just by looking at the modern character, you are, even if you speak Chinese, I, 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 I can pretty much, I'm sure that a lot of Chinese people today do not know that this character actually has this origin. Right? And they would, again, give you uh, a, a wonderful story as to why this means year. Oh, maybe this is a, I don't know, these are the, if you combine all the angles, you will have 365, <laughs> and you will have 365 days in it. No, it's, <laughs> this is how it works. Um, this means, uh, it's pronounced biao, and it means to show something, to something like that. Originally, it used to mean out outer garment, like something that you would wear on the outside. Originally written like this, the outside part, the green part, and I'm sorry if you can't see it too well, um, is a character, a standalone character for, for clothes. And the inside part is pronounced mao, so this is biao, and the, the inside part is mao, so this is the sound. And the outside, uh, close is the meaning, but again in the transition it just merged It just merged into something so the explanation that I have I, and it actually today it means to show it doesn't mean an outer garment So again, there's millions of ways you can interpret this character if you just see this We have you have to go a few steps back to and this is this is already a little bit too technical So I'm sorry, but for those who are really interested in Chinese characters it might, it might be interesting um, This is another very frequent character Qian. It means uh, front or before or in front of something <laughs> Again, many stories that you can tell, but um, originally it used to mean to cut something. Um, the, the meaning of it is here, the blue one. I'm not sure, I'm sorry if you can't see it. And it's, it's the character for tall, right? The knife. And this blue part is pronounced qian, which means it used to mean to proceed, if I'm, if I'm correct. But does, it doesn't mean, it is, it's not important what it meant. The important thing is the sound. Because qian and qian is the same thing. So that's the sound, and tall is giving you the... Uh, the meaning, I mean, the, the knife is giving you the meaning. And as you asked, is the sound always on the right and the meaning always on the left? Well, you can see here it's actually really combined. It's, it's just on the sort of like the right bottom part. And then the simplification, the, uh, the top of, the, of, of this little thing turned into just two strokes. The left <coughs> um, bottom part turned into a character which today means moon. And uh, only the bottom right is actually what still is a, a knife even in, in, in like in, in characters today. Why a knife is connected to previously? I'm sorry? Why the the meaning of knife is connected to the meaning of before? Because the character used to the character used to mean uh, to cut something originally. It, it didn't mean before. It used to mean to cut. And semantic transitions are incredibly difficult to to find out, because for instance, today we say computer mouse or just mouse. Well, we know why we say that, because it looks like a mouse, but f maybe from 100 years from now, the actual mouse will be pronounced something like moose, and then you will ask, why is mouse mouse? Like, what is it? You have no idea, right? It's really difficult to tell why there is a connection between before and uh, to cut. Maybe there is a direct uh, semantic uh, connection, but maybe it was, again, just a sound loan, because to cut and before was pronounced the same way in Chinese. So I said, all right, let's use this character to, to represent before as well. And this one, the last character, uh, Jing, this uh, is a metal or uh, gold. Again, if you just look at the modern character, it doesn't really, if you read Chinese, it doesn't really tell you much. The top part in the previous version is Jin as in today, Jin Tian the Jin, right? So that's the sound. And this is a very interesting character for me because it has actually two meaning or semantic elements. The bottom, the green one, I'm not sure if you can see it, this one. This is uh, earth, tu. And these two things just represent the or, the golden or. So the top, the blue part is a pronunciation, jin, the whole character is pronounced jin, and the bottom part is tu with the two, like earth with the two little um, ingots or the sort of like the or that represents the, uh, the actual gold. So <laughs> thank you very much if you have any questions.
bit of a double barrel question, but the first part of it is, how many of the new characters are there? And then secondly, uh, uh, you know what I mean, the more modern versions that we're talking about simplified. And then secondly, um, if you were going to learn just to a level of reading newspapers, which would you learn, the, 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 the more modern one or the, the other? Because I, I understand like if you go to Singapore and Taiwan and Hong Kong, it's one, and if you go to China, it's the other. Are you able to understand the two, or, or do you really get screwed up on the old characters versus the new characters? So this is a question of just practicality. It depends on where you go. If you go to China, you learn simplified Chinese. If you go to Taiwan, you learn traditional. It's that easy. And if you learn one, to learn the other one is really not that hard. It's really not that hard. How many, how many simplifications are there? I think I saw the list from the most frequent, most frequent characters, probably about 600, maybe, something like that, if I remember correctly. I've seen the list, but it's really, some of them are extremely logical. So some of them are hard, but some of them are very logical. Some, some elements of characters. We'll, we'll use the mic and we'll go so that it's a little bit more orderly than that. When you have a text in front of you, and when you don't recognize some characters, do you know how to read it? How to read them? Sometimes, yes. If it's a regular, like I said, some of them are extremely regular. Um, so yes, in that case, yes. But like I said, what I was showing you as a modern character is still 2000, at least 2000 years old. So it changed so much in pronunciation and in meaning that it's sometimes very hard. But it's definitely, definitely helping in like having that memory hook. You know, you at least know that ah, oh, it's probably oh, it's this one, right? Because it, you know. Thanks so much, Vladimir. Could you go back to any random slide that has the character components on it? Yeah, any of one of them is fine. That's a good one. Do high, hide the high. Yeah. Um, when Chinese are talking together about a character and they don't write it down, mm -hmm. um, they say the bu shou, the, like the zi the pang mm -hmm. and then the other side, they kind of have trouble, or at least I have trouble, referencing this other part that's Shen not the fu. radical. I think it's called a sheng fu. Yeah, is there, there's many, many more of these, it seems like, because the radicals is like... Yeah, there's about 600 of the most frequent ones. I did a, like a, a frequency study on that, and I think that with the, when it comes to the most frequent ones, it's about, it's about 600 of the most frequent ones. Right, so I guess my question is, considering how important those are, and actually how they're more numerous than radicals, and they give you sound information mm -hmm. about the character, I, I wonder what it is that makes, like, <clears throat> study materials for Westerners kind of don't mention them very much they say the radicals are a big because part the of it, research not. takes a lot of time and no one does it and <laughs> i spent like five years just trying to figure it out so it's much easier to publish a book where you have these stories and uh, it's more attractive <laughs> i guess that's it there are people re seriously researching this but not publishing houses that oh I just had a comment on the, the before when you say six hundred uh, uh, simplified variations. I re yeah. realize, of course, that, that components of characters are also simplified. Yes. So every place where that character has that particular element of it, it is also simplified and <coughs> count as a, a simplified character. So mm -hmm. the number may be considerably larger than yeah. six hundred. Mm -hmm. Could you give a very short and very clear? Uh, a uh, guide to how to look word, uh, look, look, yeah, well, words up, uh, signs up in a Chinese dictionary. Uh, yeah, the best thing is uh, if you <laughs> if you have a like a smartphone. <laughs> you know that smartphone? <laughs> um, well, the, usually the way I do it is uh, I have a smartphone app where I can just write it with my just like with my finger and. Uh, it looks it up, but in other ways, that's pretty hard. I mean, I know how to do it, but it's just very tiring. Because you, um, yeah, it's just, <laughs> usually I count the strokes and then look at the, the one that the, according to the strokes and try to find it there. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that, Vladimir. Um, with the, what you have learned now, because I, I, as far as I'm aware, you've been learning uh, Chinese for nine more oh. years now. Mm -hmm. So, um, how uh, for us basically as beginners or those who have elementary um, mm -hmm. knowledge about the <coughs> language um how would you actually uh if you're actually going to start now how are you going to hack basically uh the chinese script or the hands uh i would first learn how to speak fluently and then learn how to read um because i and i did that actually uh 
when you when you start reading after you've learned how to speak, it's much easier. You just open it, the, a book, and you say, oh, this is how this, oh, I know this. It's so simple because I know the words. It's written like that. I didn't know that. And it sticks like instantly. So that's how we do it. Yeah, um, this is not really a question, but an answer or a comment to the question why is like front related to cut because it is and in my dialect it still is because uh, in my dialect qian would be xi yi and then we still have two verbs right now which sounds like xi yi or xiao xiao is like cutting which is like cutting crops so like working the field and xi yi is like cutting a part of meat when you go to a butcher it's very very specific so you want to order a certain portion of pork and that's exactly the uh, verb that you would use. And in modern Chinese language, I don't think we use that anymore because it's super specific. But if you want to trace the meaning of a, or the roots of lots of words, you might want to look into some of the ancient dialects in Chinese. Namely, uh, the most ancient one I think is Hokkien, which is spoken in the Fujian province in Taiwan. And then the second a most ancient might be Cantonese, and the third one might be mine, which is Wu dialect. Which is still, these three are still very widely spoken. And in my dialect, for instance, we still <coughs> keep a lot of um, single character ver verbs and nouns, which are very common in Asian Chinese, but um, not anymore in modern Chinese. So I think if you want to trace that, you can almost always find a reason. If you, you said you cut a certain part of the pork meat, is it the front part of the meat? No, it's just... No, it's just cutting a part of the meat. All right. yeah. So yeah, all right. I think it, yeah. they, they just share the same sounds. Right. So then they decide mm -hmm. to boil. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I was just because I was trying to make a relation between cut and, and front. So if you if it would be uh, pointing to a specific front part of the meat, then then would, it would make sense why a front used to mean no. to cut. They have exactly same sounds. Okay. Yeah. So. All right. Next question. Yes, so I know there is a stipulated stroke order, but how strict are they about mandating that, or is it not such a mandate? I think pretty, pretty much. <laughs> there are some mistakes that they make here and there, but it's so natural once you, once you learn how to do it. I'm not very fluent in writing, but um, all my like Taiwanese Chinese friends, they just write, and it's still the same thing. So <laughs> it's like our alphabet, like second nature. Yeah, in fact, it was just uh, coming to what you'd say. Is there any material we can find somewhere on the web, or if you could give me a quote? Oh, on this uh, um, uh, dialect in, in Chinese, because I they were supposed to have a lecture yesterday, but it didn't. Right. Um, um, it didn't um, I'm not sure about hooking, but um, it's very old and certainly why it's spoken, so I would expect something to be there. Cantonese, certainly. A lot of materials about Cantonese. About my dialect, I was desperately looking for a lot of materials. I did manage to find some, because, you know, uh, there are still people doing research, but a limited. If you want the resource, I can give it to you. By the way, I'm sorry, um, qian as in front. It's qian and jian is the cut, right? But it's I'm just gonna show you the character. Uh, the other way. <laughs> so this is qian as in front and jian is this one with an added knife below that, right? There's a, there would be another where is it? Uh, how do I point? There will be another knife character under this one, and then it would mean to cut. I, well, you know, that's <laughs> when I just wanted to add an example of that was with um, the original meaning being bear, mm. right? And then now it's come back. It kind of like went full circle. So it started as bear and then changed meaning, and then they added something to it to mean bear again. Yeah, so the fire. Yeah, because bear meat used to be eaten, and they just added the fire uh, character under that, and it means bear. But yeah, sure. Right. It's not out of common myself actually, because I, I think you see this represented in many language families where, and this is why particularly like learning families of languages and geographically fa languages that are related. Um, so they may not be in the same family, but they're related because of cultural ties or something else. And you see these words, these etymologies that you're saying with the Chinese dialects connecting and explaining why we say things in any language. It's yeah. really, really cool. For instance, in Slovak, pomaranč means orange, and I never, I just thought it's pomaranč, but then I heard the Serbian word pomoranja, 
which is from orange, basically. So it's a yeah. it's an orange apple, but I, I never looked at that Slovak word that way until I heard the Serbian one. Uh, I just wanted to comment on the stroke order thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's most prevalent in uh, cursive handwriting, mm -hmm. because when you write in cursive, you simplify the characters a lot, and, and they just become a single line down the page, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> so when you stick to the stroke order, you can still make out enough features to identify all the characters. That is true. And, and plus, if you don't preserve the stroke order, the character is going to be completely out of balance, because there is um, there is a, uh, a reason why they do it like that because when you first do the horizontal one and then you cut it You know where exactly the middle is whereas if you do it in the other way around it's going to be out of proportion with the rest of the character One more question I was wondering Just a second because there are a couple <coughs> yeah. of hands going up oh, right. Sorry, sorry uh, Yes, the book that you're writing, how many characters are you going to include in it? There are going to be 200 fully researched characters in it It takes really a lot of time to get to the to the etymology of every single one, but I would be, I would like to publish another version, another version with the well, 200 most frequent ones. I was wondering about the new, new words. Mm -hmm. What do they do? Like, you mean low, mouse, low mouse words? Mouse and the computer, the computer mouse. That doesn't really have to do anything with the character. They combine actual characters. For instance, uh, computer is no, which is an elect electrical brain. Um, what, would you, what is like a modern word like? Uh, electrical voice, uh, electrical vision. They already have characters for that. If they use their own characters to, like we say, telephone, it's the, almost the same thing. Tele, far, phone, sound. In this case, it's so electrical sound. So all the ones waiting or, or, I'm sorry, second way they do it is they, uh, like, engine, uh, right? Engine. They just choose characters that sound like sound, that. Shafa right. is a sofa. Chocolate. Chocolate. Mm -hmm. So, so we're waiting to get in. We can take maybe one or two more questions. If <coughs> no? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.